Well, welcome back, everybody. Ooh. Have a good lunch. Good. So this morning, we looked at how language is wrapped up in the rhizome that is the problem for the client. But that's only part of the story. Um, because when uh, Bandler and Grinder were <coughs> playing with this idea, mainly Grinder, they were good friends with a personal hero of mine, uh, a guy by the name of Gregory Bateson, brilliant anthropologist, uh, thought leader in the mid 20th century. And he said to Bandler and Grinder, you know, you guys only have half the story. Yeah. There's this guy down in Phoenix, Arizona that you have to meet. And I don't think I don't think I shared with you guys how I got into all of this. Um, some of you kind of know this story, others this will be new. But probably as long as I can remember, I've been interested in the mind and no, hypnosis, meditation, people reading, all that good stuff. Uh, it was always kind of like a, a side interest of mine growing up. And when I went to university, I was really fortunate because the school I went to, not only did it have a massive library, it had a massive collection of hypnosis books. And I was really fortunate because these weren't just any hypnosis books. Uh, these were mostly books from that same guy in Phoenix, Arizona. Milton Erickson. And up until that point, I kind of liked hypnosis on the stage side and the magic side. Uh, but for me, my frame as a you know teenager was, ooh, you can make people do stuff. You, you sit them down, you give them a lot of suggestions about probably like relaxing or something, or maybe make them stare at something until their eyes get too heavy to keep open. And then that's it. And when I was at university, my freshman year, I saw that there was, when I looked up hypnosis in the, in the computer for the library, I saw all of these books listed, and I noticed that Erickson's name kept coming up and coming up and coming up. I thought, well, all right, I'm going to check this guy out. I didn't really have a frame of reference for who he was or what he did. Uh, and the first book I picked out, just out of sheer luck mostly, was the collected papers of Milton H. Erickson, Volume 1. Uh, and this was a collection of case studies, papers he had written for journals, uh, presentations that he had made during, uh, during conferences. And I couldn't help but be absolutely transfixed by this. I sat down, we had a nice big library, it was like six stories tall, and we had these big, cushy, comfortable chairs, and when I write, whenever I needed a break from like the academic stuff, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna totally nerd out now, get my Erickson book. I sit in the library with my Starbucks and a cushy chair and just start reading. And some really interesting things begin to happen. The first is that something that I thought should have been dry and academic, you know, papers, were some of the most compelling stories I had read. And some of these papers had transcripts of the work that Erickson did with people. Everything from hypnotic inductions through change work. Some of his provocative stuff, some of his simple stuff. And I found that as I was reading through this book, I kept getting more and more curious. Because to me, it was as if he was doing magic. I couldn't quite understand, you know, how, how it was that as I read through the stuff, this guy was getting the changes that he said he was getting. It had to be absolute magic. And another interesting thing began to happen because as I read through these papers, I started to experience some interesting phenomena myself. For example, my perception of time changed. Uh, I experienced catalepsy. At one point, I started having hallucinations. 
like all the classical stuff that traditional hypnotists said were really hard to elicit. I was sitting in a library experiencing this by reading papers that had been written 60 years before that moment. So then I got really fascinated and I wanted to know how to do the magic. How was he doing this? So I picked up the structure of magic. Add in the title, why not? <clears throat> With the forward by Gregory Bateson. This was Bandler and Grinder treating actually Virginia Satir, working with Virginia Satir's stuff and a couple of other people. And all of a sudden I was introduced to the world of NLP. The problem was though that these books, Structure of Magic and the Patterns of Milton H. Erickson, while interesting, were very kind of, in my experience, dry and a bit more academic than what I was getting from reading Erickson's stuff. So I put it down and I kind of thought, you know what, this NLP stuff's a bit, it's a bit too complicated for me. So I kept with the hypnosis and kept reading Erickson and pretty much read and consumed everything I could get my hands on. This was like during the heyday of eBay as well, so I got my hands on lots of footage that the Ericksonians would not be happy about. So they hold on to their stuff very tightly. And eventually, when I was in my PhD program, I thought, you know what? I need to do something for me. I, I need to, you know, have another interest outside of academia. So I thought, you know. I'll go, take a hypno I'll go take a hypnosis class. Why not? It'll be really fun. I've had like 10 years of seriously studying this on a conceptual level. Why not go out there and do it? So I signed up for a hypnosis training and it was, a, it was an introductory course and it was massive. It's actually the first time I met Sarah. And I'll never forget it. It was over in Times Square in this terrible, terrible hotel. But that didn't matter because I was so excited to finally be at a live event. And I walk into this ballroom and I wasn't really sure what to expect. But as I walk in and I look around, I see like hundreds of people. I was like, oh my God. Well, at least there'll be lots of practice then. So I sit down and the trainer comes up and he does his big opening thing and talks about what trance is and what trance isn't, starts to tell some metaphors, things that I'm really used to hearing from Erickson. And what ended up happening was, as I found myself going into trance and my perception changing, it was really easy for me to just kind of want to sit there and just be like, oh, just keep talking, hypnotist, just keep doing your thing, I'm good. But then it was time to actually do an exercise. And like, this is it. This is the moment I was waiting for, was to go and like actually have the practice. So I sit down with this guy, my practice partner, and I sit there. I look at him. I still sit there. And I don't say a word. I have no idea what to actually say to this person. And I had this moment of, uh-oh. But that went by really quick because then it was time to switch over. And my practice partner said to me, <laughs> says, oh, what, did you forget to do the exercise? I was like, oh shit. <laughs> uh, like 10 years of like all this academic study and intellectual interest just on the drain and I had this moment of like oh my god what am I doing here can, can I even do this stuff I mean maybe this isn't for me maybe maybe I'm not cut out for this type of thing uh, and then my mind started to drift back to everything that I had read about Erickson and Milton Erickson is he's a character he was a character in many ways and some of the interventions he did with people were really unconventional. Like he had one client who had a lot of social anxiety and she was a bit of a shut-in. She was agoraphobic, didn't want to talk to anybody in her community. So he gave her this task. And the task was simply, uh, he knew that he liked, she liked to garden. So he had her 
take a piece off of her African violet plants and find out when everybody's birthday was in the town. And on their birthday, gift them a plant. She did this for a year. She knew everybody in the town. The agoraphobia was gone. She had friends. She had this wonderfully fulfilling life now. Uh, and that was just kind of the tip of the iceberg because that was more on the tasking side. And when we think of Erickson, we think of the artful use of language. And there was a, another story, and this is kind of a typical thing that Erickson did with a lot of people. And he'd have, have a client and he'd say to them, after doing like this nice, long, hypnotic experience, that at some point in the future, and you don't know when it's going to happen, but you're going to see a flash of light, a flash of color, and it will be a flash of insight into this change that you're making. And it's kind of uh, an interesting one because when I first read this, it was like, oh, it's magic again, and I almost didn't believe it was true until we were training with John uh, a few weeks ago, John Overdorf, and somebody asked him about that actual story because they know the person that it happened to. She had been in a training with Erickson years and years and years ago. And she had something that she wanted to work through. And throughout the training, she didn't quite know what was happening because she had thought she would have been a demo, but he never pulled her up to be a, a demonstration volunteer. In fact, she really knew that something's happening inside the experience, but she couldn't quite consciously put her finger on it. So she sat through the training. And when she left, it was about a year later, she saw this flash of color. And then some memories came to her about what had happened at that training. And she had a recognition of just how much things have changed already. And it really is fascinating to think about how easy it is for change to take place and how really the artful use of language facilitates that. Because we have the language of our bodies, we have our breathing, our tempo, our tonality. But we also do have the words. And it's not that every word's important, but it's about the relationship those words facilitate. And I can remember sitting in a room very similar to this one about five years ago, and sitting in actually one of these chairs like this, and it was the, the first time that I had met John. I'd known John and Sarah for some time by then, and they're like, oh, you have to train with this guy. So I went to a training that he had held in our space. And one of the first things he did was to start to tell a story about Erickson oh. and about, about Erickson and his artful use of language and how language itself can change your state. How words paint pictures, as do gestures. He told a story about when Erickson moved down to Arizona. Because Milton Erickson, uh, he grew up, he was born in Nevada, but he grew up most of his life in the Midwest. He was a, a farming kid. Uh, and he ended up working in Wisconsin as, as a psychiatrist and psychologist for a long time. But he had gotten sick, he had polio when he was younger, and then he had gotten it again when he was an adult. And his doctor said to him, look, the way that you can really feel good is to change your state. And Erickson thought about it and thought, okay, what state should I change to? The doctor recommended somewhere warm, so he thought I'd go down to Phoenix, Arizona, back to the desert. 
So Erickson packs up the family and kids and, and Mrs. Erickson and they get in the car. And they drive all the way down to the deep, that's it, deep Southwest, down to Arizona. All the while changing states. Because if you want to have a sense of well-being, you really do have to change your states. And I don't know the experiences that Erickson had with his family driving all the way down to Phoenix. But I do know that that change in state had some wonderful outcomes for him. Because when they got to their house in Arizona, they pull in the driveway and they start looking around. Mrs. Erickson goes into the garage and sees that there's a whole bunch of junk left in there. A whole bunch of junk that belongs to somebody else. And she says to Dr. Erickson, I gotta throw that junk out. It's not yours belong to somebody else, not yours at all. And I can remember sitting there, completely motionless, still, captivated by this story, one that I hadn't heard before about Erickson, and one particularly interesting because it wasn't about client work. But it was simply about how easy change is. And Erickson's really known for his artful use of language and one of the ways that he would like to use language was to be artfully vague and ambiguous. Because just as Bandler and Grinder thought that you could chunk down to the deep structures in order to get change, Erickson knew something different. When you move away from the deep structure and you go up into the abstract, it becomes easy to change states. And there are lots of ways that you can use language to do this. We have a list there because far be it from me to say that each and every time in this moment, you take a breath, you could feel more comfortable. Because I know some of you are having certain internal experiences right now, certain thoughts. And I know other people have already changed states deeply. And I don't know how much relaxation you could be experiencing now. But if you were to track your current experience, you might begin to notice something shifting because it really is better to change your states when you're learning because you are transforming. Deep inside, new learnings are growing your trance, forming deep inside, new. Learnings are growing their transformation, deep inside, that which is due. Because you can learn and grow. As something happens inside the trance, formation. Now, and I don't know just how much more vague that can be, but Erickson was really skilled at this type of language play. And that's really where a lot of the magic comes in. Because Erickson understood something that's really important for you to understand now. Because he understood that no matter what you think you are, in this moment. You are in all ways 
more than that. And it's true. Because I heard John say it a couple weeks ago, that no matter what you think you are now, you are always more than that. And even more than that. Because as soon as you think you know who you are, you can rest assured that there is more there. That's it. And when we're working with clients, we get to speak to that part that is so much more than that narrow stream of your conscious awareness. So much more than whatever chatter is happening in your head. So much more than the pictures. Because you are more than that. And this is something that Erickson really understood. And that's how he was able to make magic happen. That's how he was able to task people and have them follow through. Or make these hypnotic suggestions about knowing that at some point in your future, and I don't know when, something's going to happen in your sensory awareness. And you'll remember this, that you are so much more than you could possibly consciously know. And, you know, as I sat there in that training room, I did remember something else that Erickson said. He said, you can pretend anything and master it. And that's kind of what I did. I thought, you know what? If I'm like really bad at doing hypnosis to Jess, why don't I do hypnosis as Milton Erickson? That would be really good. And that's what I did. I spent the entire rest of the training as Milton Erickson. And I spent the next training I went to as Milton Erickson. I spent the first couple clients I worked with as Milton Erickson. Until I forgot to be him and started being something more than that. Because we are more than that. Until I eventually met Sean and Sarah. We met in a, another training event in California and we spent a month in Mexico together after that at another training event. Uh, and then Sarah's like, Jess, you have, to, you have to study NLP. And I'm like, you know, I've read The Structure of Magic. I've, I've sat in the library and I've read the hypnotic patterns of Milton H. Erickson. I've read Frogs and the Princes and uh, Time to Change Your Brain, Try to Change Your Brain for a Change, whatever that book is. <laughs> read all that stuff. It feels like so clunky. And Sarah's like, ah, that's not what we do. We do HNLP. And it's about the relationship. It's about the human side. It's about going first and experiencing states because we're not programming people, despite what Bandler and Grinder wanted in the early days. We're about building relationship and a relationship that facilitates change. So then I got really interested. It's like, okay, I guess I'll study this NLP stuff. Uh, and then they introduced me to John and here we are now. So that's my story. That's how I got into all this. And uh, you never know just how far a change will go. Let's just say that. <laughs>